understanding. Used 160 times in 156 verses of the Bible. The intelligence and insight of both God and men. like the morning mist there in the morning but when the heat of day comes and when the trials of life it's gone good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you are my name is rod hembry and i'm corey this is quick study a program designed to take you through the bible in one year now the reason i mentioned that at the beginning is we are in the book of hosea we are it is a prophet and in this prophet uses some amazing word pictures to describe mm -hmm. the lack of faithfulness in ancient mm -hmm. israel Love like the morning mist. Now we'll talk about that and what we can learn from it to avoid conditional love today. What do you have today for us on uh, Bible Archaeology? Well, today in our reading, there is a specific place mentioned, and we are going to explore it in history and archaeology. That place is Mizpah. Really? Yes. We hear it a lot in the Bible, but we really don't know about it. We'll find out. Ryan is here with Cosmic Mysteries, right? In today's report, we're exploring Johann Kepler's three planetary laws of motion. I hope you stick around for that. All right, all of that and more coming up right here on the Quick Study Radio and Television program. Stay there. Let's study. Now, one of the amazing features about the Bible is that it contains actual history and as it's containing history, it talks about a lot of different specific people, people groups, and nations, and specific cities and places. Now, this is interesting to the historian, but sometimes confusing to the layperson. Right now, you and I are going to take a look at one of these places. The city of Mizpah was established as an important site early in the history of Israel. In the time period of the judges, Mizpah was used as a national rallying point for a man of the Levites who asked for national justice. At the end of the time period of the judges, recorded in the book of 1 Samuel, the prophet Samuel judged the nation from Mizpah. He also held national gatherings at the city, and eventually Israel's first king, Saul, was presented to the nation at Mizpah. The name Mizpah means watchtower or lookout, and the city was located centrally in the country within the territory of Benjamin. Its importance as an administrative center of sorts is demonstrated not only by its use during the days of the judges and Samuel, but also by its utilization by conquering nations. Years later, when Judah would be taken over by the empire of Babylon, Mizpah would be used by Babylon as an administrative center and would become the city that Governor Gedaliah would attempt to encourage the people from. There have been two archaeological sites considered for the identification of ancient Mizpah. Both are within a 10-mile range from Jerusalem and both fit well after excavations with the biblical narrative. Tel and Naspa, however, is the site often considered the more likely of the two. It was thoroughly excavated from 1926 to 1935. The overseeing archaeologist excavated over two-thirds of the site, nearly unheard of at that time. He is also still praised for the meticulous records he kept that say for us, descriptions of roads, buildings, potteries, and landscape that may have been seen by Samuel himself.
It's time to explore the wise guys of the Bible. They're all around us. Now, today we focus on a tragic prophet, Hosea. Chapter 6 to 7 is our reading assignment. Now, romantic enticements, flowers and chocolates do not a marriage make. Men are often in love with sex rather than their mates. Women are often in love with fantasies of marriage rather than the chosen man. Such love is like the morning mist. It's there at first, but later burned away by the realities of life on planet Earth. So God compares ancient Israel's love for him to that. The wise guy Hosea hears the heart of the Redeemer in chapter 6. In these 11 verses, we are challenged to examine our own relationships with God. Let's study it. and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud, and like the early dew it goes away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and your judgments are like light that goes forth. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But like men they transgress the covenant, there they dealt treacherously with me. Gilead is a city of evil doers and defiled with blood. As bands of robbers lie in wait for a man, so the company of priests murder on the way to Shechem. Surely they commit lewdness. I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is harlotry of Ephraim, Israel is defiled. Also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed for you when I return the captives of my people. Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. You're watching Quick Study Television and listening to the radio. We are going through the Bible in one year, and today we continue. Now, if you've been watching the Quick Study weekday edition, we have already introduced the man Hosea. What a prophet. God told him to marry a prostitute in this evil land. It was supposed to be God's land, but they had forgotten about God and it turned into evil. God's people were rebelling against his ways. And he says, marry a prostitute to show the relationship that I have with rebellious Israel. What a stunning prophet. Well, now we're into chapter 6 of Hosea, where we're talking about the R word. Do you know what the R word is? It's a word not talked about in the modern church frequently today, repentance. That is stopping to do what you do and making excuses for it and turning your life in the direction of devotion to Jesus Christ. Here's the scripture. Hosea says, come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. Look at that line, amazing line. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. What a stunning prophecy. And so with that, we come to the point. And the point is this. There is no substitute in relationship with God. There is no substance, rather, in relationship with God when there is no daily repentance. You know, somebody told me, well, I repented back in 1968. I don't have to worry, but well, let me tell you something. Just to let everybody know, I repent every day of my life. 
because I am so concerned about being right with God that I desire, Lord, if there's anything in my life on this day, please confront it and please help me. By the way, that also keeps you very humiliated, which is a good thing. I know who I am. I know who Jesus is. And I know what that means. He is perfect. I am not. But he has called me to be devoted in following him and to begin to change my ways to the power of the Holy Spirit. And the changing of your ways is real repentance. You cannot have a relationship with God, a quality relationship with God, unless you have a willingness every day of your life to say, Lord, I am not going to be like Frank Sinatra. I do not want to do it my way. I want to do it your way. Here's the scripture. We continue on. Now, he says, O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like the morning mist, that is, the morning clouds or the morning mist, and like the early dew that goes away. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and your judgments are like lights that go forth. God's discipline. Here is the point. Beloved, there can be no substance in relationship with God where there is no commitment to serve God. Now, let me ask all of us a question today. Who are we serving? Are we serving ourselves? Is our comfort more important? Are there limits to our obedience to God? Well, that means we're serving ourselves. But Paul the Apostle would say in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Don't serve yourself. Serve your Lord. And when you do that, your life goes better. The fruits of the Spirit manifest in your life, the first three which are love, joy, and peace. But we must move on because it gets better. Here is the scripture, beloved. The Bible says, for I desire mercy, the Lord says. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, works of religion. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings or rituals. But like men, they transgress the covenant. And there they dealt treacherously with me. What a line. Gilead is a city of evildoers and defiled by blood as bands of robbers lie in wait for a man. So the company of priests murder on their way to Shechem. Surely they commit lewdness. I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is harlotry of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed for you when I return the captives of my people. What's he saying? Here's the point. What he's saying is, there's no substance in relationship with God or in our Christianity with God when there's no real desire, a desire to change our lives for him. If you really know him, your behavior will show him. In other words, I'll put it another way in quoting uh, the word of God itself, one of the greatest prophets and apostles who ever lived, James the Just. Faith without works is dead. It does not mean that you work to achieve your salvation. What it means is salvation works in you to achieve behavior change. And so, beloved, may we remember today that the substance of relationship with God is always made known in us. Now, the word for made known in religious language is manifest. Is always made known in us. When we desire to serve Him instead of us, when we are willing to repent, and when we learn the heart of God to pray for the lost, and not always to pray for ourselves, but to learn the heart of God and to change and to, well, expose mercy on others instead of ritual, to do the works of healing and help in our communities and in our families. The most important community you have is your family. And if your family does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, what a mission field. They can look at your life each and every day. Beloved, think on these words from the book of Hosea. Now, there are many cities and places mentioned within the scriptures. Earlier on in the program, we took a look at a city that was mentioned in Hosea chapter 5, um, which was the city of Mizpah. Right now, you and I are going to continue looking at cities, but this time it's closer to home in Israel. It was the capital city for many years of northern Israel. The city is Samaria, and it does not fare well in the prophets. 
The city of Samaria was the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel for many years. The city was founded by King Omri after he purchased the land, recorded in 1 Kings. The name Samaria means mountain of watching. Archaeological findings of wine and oil presses, manufacturing areas, and large cisterns reveal that the site was likely a large agricultural center. The Bible reports that King Omri built on the hill of Samaria. In the early 1900s, Omri's palace complex was unearthed at the very top of the hill of Samaria. Its foundation is the rock of the mountain, carved away to create a 13-foot high platform. Two chambers have also been discovered underneath the floors of the palace that probably served as the tombs of King Omri and his infamous son, King Ahab. The city of Samaria was destroyed by invading Assyria in 722 BC, recorded in 2 Kings 17. A major change for the ruined city came in 30 BC when it was given to Herod the Great by the Emperor of Rome, Augustus. Herod renamed Samaria Sebast, a Greek word that means Augustus. At the top of the summit, right over the ruins of Omri and Ahab's palace, Herod built a temple to worship Augustus. Well, in AD 66, the city was finally destroyed by Rome itself. Today, it seems as if the land has rejected its sordid past. It is an almond orchard, dotted here and there with ancient stone markers of a very different time. Equidistant lettering, the Bible codes, this phenomenon does not occur in any other religious books or in any other ancient literature, not in Homer's Iliad or in the writings of Josephus. It doesn't occur in recent history, medieval writings, Shakespeare, or other poets. This mysterious code occurs only in the 66 books of the Bible. But what is the Bible code? And is it important to Bible believers? Is it a dangerous cult seduction? Or is it authentic? Join Rod, Janice, and Corey Hembry in a special, never-released, one-hour DVD video about the Bible codes and what they really mean. We also need your help this summer and your support. We are supported by viewers just like you. We will send you the never-seen DVD Bible code with Rod, Janice, and Corey Hembry when you write or call. Our suggested donation is a gift of $20 or more. You can write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. Or in Canada and the rest of the world, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W 5G2. You can also call for faster service at 724-733-8336 or 519-940-8338. Well, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God in Psalm 19. So we studied the stars and we're learning science from Ryan. So here's Ryan with Cosmic Mysteries. Last weekend, we studied the life of Johann Kepler. Now, Kepler was the father of physical astronomy and is best known for his three laws of planetary motion. It is these three laws that we study today. One of the founding fathers of modern scientific study and the founder of physical astronomy was German-born Johann Kepler. Kepler is best known for discovering the three laws of planetary motion. During his lifetime, most believed in an Earth-centered or geocentric solar system. In this overcomplicated model, the Sun and planets revolve around the Earth in combinations of circles. Kepler, who is a strong believer in God, concluded that if the universe was created by an intelligent designer, then it should function in a straightforward logical pattern. Kepler believed that a random universe was inconsistent with a wise creator. Though many had given up on finding any simple logical pattern for the motion of the planets, Kepler kept searching with the assumption that there was an intelligent designer behind the universe. Kepler's first attempts to solve the mystery of the motion of the planets were largely based off the mathematics and the philosophies of the ancient Greeks. 
Kepler published these ideas in 1595 in a book entitled Cosmic Mystery, though due to the inaccuracy of the data he used, many of his ideas were later proven wrong. However, Kepler's work got the attention of the brilliant Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. Brahe was so impressed with Kepler's mathematical ability and his keenness to apply it to astronomy that he offered him a job at his observatory in Prague. In 1600, Kepler joined his staff and was given the task of investigating the orbit of Mars. These astronomers had already been charting the paths of the planets for many years, but could not resolve the complicated paths they saw. Yet now, Kepler had access to the data he needed to solve this mystery. He concluded that the commonly accepted geocentric model of the solar system just simply did not work. So instead, he tried non-circular paths until he found the true solution. Mars revolves in an elliptical orbit with the Sun occupying one of its focuses. This is the first of Kepler's three laws of planetary motion, and is officially stated as follows. All planets move in elliptical orbits with the Sun at one focus and the other focus empty. This law is also known as the law of ellipses. Additionally, Kepler discovered that planets do not move at a constant speed as was once thought. He demonstrated that the imaginary line joining the Sun to the planet sweeps through equal areas of the ellipse in equal amounts of time. This means that planets move faster when they are closer to the Sun and slower when they are farther from it. This is Kepler's second law of planetary motion and is officially stated this way. The line joining the planet to the Sun sweeps over equal areas in equal time intervals. This law is known as the law of equal areas. Kepler published these first two laws in his 1609 publication called The New Astronomy. It was not until 10 years later that Kepler published the third law in his 1619 release called Harmony of the Worlds. This law mathematically related the time a planet takes to complete an orbit of the Sun and the average distance of that planet away from the Sun. It is officially stated as follows. For any planet, the square of its period of revolution is directly proportional to the cube of its mean distance from the Sun. This is also called the Law of Harmonies. Kepler started with the assumption that there is a God behind the design of the universe and believed the words of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet when he said that God established the laws of heaven and earth. Kepler's sound reasoning led him to discover these very elegant laws of planetary motion, which without a creator have no reason to even be established. Because of Kepler's starting assumptions that the universe and everything in it did indeed have a creator, he was able to have an extremely successful career. Let us take a lesson from this wise guy, Johann Kepler. Yeah, and he was. And the interesting thing here is that many of the foundational science were scientists were, had a strong belief in God. And actually, the truth is, Ryan, and uh, Dr. Paul Davies also reminds us of this in the uh, video, The Privileged Planet, and that is that every scientist depends upon certain absolutes in order to be able to measure the various experiments that he does. And so you have to have something solid. You have to have an absolute to even conduct the scientific mm. method. It's very interesting. Very, and we, we're in an interesting time in science, Ryan, because uh, there's a lot of new things happening, especially among the creation scientists. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, Ryan, because you study a lot of these guys. You have your master's in creation science. And my question is, which one is your favorite creation scientist today? Oh, man, how am I supposed to answer that? There's so many good ones. I mean, you got Dr. Jason Lyle, you got Danny Faulkner, you got, uh, of course, Gary Bates, who wrote Alien Intrusion. Um, I really like Chuck Misler as well. And Dr. Sarfati. And Dr. Sarfati. Uh, Dr. Carter and Dr. Stanford. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. There's too many. How, how can you, yeah, you're, you can't yeah, just, you, you know, you have to list them all. I mean, these, all great. really, these guys are well qualified, and uh, they, they really are, and so it's very exciting. And uh, one thing I want to mention here that I didn't mention last week, I should have mentioned last week. What is it? We have this new thing that's happened to the human race in the last 40 years. It's called video recording. Because we have video recording, we at this moment, are, your mother and I, are recovering from a very important wedding. We are. Because you are and I am. <laughs> exactly. On the 14th of September, Jasmine was married to Ryan. Yes, it's That's true. Right. I now have a sister. It's true, <laughs> and I have a new daughter. And uh, we have a whole new family on that side, so I want to say congratulations. So at the time we're recording this, and the time last week, we were doing weddings. We were. So anyway, that's, that's very cool. And you're soon to come. Soon, yes, February. Big announcement coming up. Watch Daily Quick Study. We're not going to announce it yet, but a big announcement coming up. Well, let's announce it in October. 
Okay, okay. Because it's, it's after Canadian Thanksgiving and before American Thanksgiving. You know what? I think you're right. That's a good, it's a good time bracket. All right, so we're going to announce a <laughs> very special event coming up uh, in the October programs. And remember, we need your help. Would you write to us and help us? We'll send you the Bible guide. When we do send you the Bible guide, it'll come with the discovery letter. Uh, partner with us in any amount, $10 a month, $25, $50, whatever God tells you to do. Here's the website for radio and television, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com. It is hard to understand what real covenant relationship is with our Lord in this present darkness. Many of the church have fallen away who actually never really were believers, but they were cultural Christians. Where is the example of devotion to God? God's wisdom is at work in us when we look to the Bible to discover thousands of true and faithful testimonies in God's men and women recorded there. The Bible is real history and records real men and women who became and stayed faithful to their Lord. So with that we pray, Lord, teach me to see the amazing testimonies of your men and women in the Bible. We continue to study the book of Proverbs. Today we are reading Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. Here's what it says. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. What an interesting point. Men and women have many dreams that are conjured up in their own minds, but God is sovereign, and He has the ability to take our dreams and move them into His will. That is, if we surrender to Him. And when we do that, we suddenly learn the purpose for our life. Now may I encourage you today that if you're feeling troubled in your heart, dirty, guilty, and, and you've been used and abused, well let me encourage you that Jesus Christ wants you. And He asks for you to come to Him because it shows your willingness. How do you do that? You, it's not by joining a church or going to communion or anything. It's by in your heart praying and saying out loud, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me and rose again on the third day, and today I take you as my Lord. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you for joining us today on Quick Study. Remember 24-7 video Bible studies by Chuck Misler, Rabbi Zacharias, and many more are on BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Join us there, BibleDiscoveryTV.com, also on the Roku box.